You guys like what I have on today? Lovely. Like the shirt, the shorts, the the worn out shoe. You know, I bought these shoes at the end of May and they're already worn out. I'm a little disappointed in that. No, it's perfect. I know what you're probably thinking. Pastor Mike's finally lost his mind. Either that or did Pastor Mike forget it's Sunday? That wouldn't surprise me if I forgot it was Sunday one week. Maybe you're thinking we should probably sit down with Pastor Mike, have a little chat after worship about this. This just isn't quite right. Or maybe we should go buy him some new clothes. I'd be all right with that, actually. In the first century and before, and we can see this in Scripture, it was known what people did or how important they were by what they wore, how they dressed. Let me read to you from Deuteronomy. It was also known if someone was a man or a woman. Deuteronomy chapter 22 says, A woman must not wear man, men's clothing, nor a man wear women's clothing. For the Lord your God detests anyone who does this. Now, 21st century, there's not as much of a difference between men's and women's clothing as there was thousands of years ago like this. But it tells us that there was definitely a distinction between men's and women's clothing and Simply by the clothing, you could tell if the person's a man or a woman. There are some other examples of telling who a person is by their clothing. In Luke chapter 7, after John's messengers left, John the Baptist, after John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about him. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Also in Luke, we get another description of a rich man of the time in this parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At the gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. So you have this description of what a rich man looked like at the time. And then we go back even further into Exodus. We get a description of priestly garments, what the priests were supposed to wear. I'm going to read a few, uh, a few verses here from, verse, or from chapter 39 of Exodus. From the blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, they made woven garments for ministering in the sanctuary. They also made sacred garments for Aaron, as the Lord commanded Moses. They made the ephod of gold and of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and of finely twisted linen. They hammered out thin sheets of gold and cut strands to be worked into the blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and fine linen, the work of skilled hands. They fashioned the breast piece, the work of a skilled craftsman. They made it like the ephod of gold and of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and of finely twisted linen. They made the robe of the ephod entirely of blue cloth, the work of a weaver. And it goes on and it keeps describing all of this. They made the plate, the sacred emblem, out of pure gold and engraved on it like an inscription on a seal, holy to the Lord. Then they fashioned a blue cord to it and attached it to the turban as the Lord commanded Moses. This was a pretty elaborate garment. You guys think I should start wearing something like that? Please don't. Who's gonna, are we gonna pay for that? We got, we got money for all this gold and fine linen and everything? But at this time, you could certainly tell how important someone was. You could tell who someone was, what their job was, even if they were a man or a woman, simply by what they wore. And my friends, the same is true today. If you see someone walking around in a black shirt with that little turned around collar, clerical collar, right? You know it's somebody in ministry. Usually someone from one of the more traditional faith groups, but Roman Catholic, some Lutheran, Anglican, for example. Uh, but there's a lot of clergy that wear this. If you see someone wearing scrubs, you know what scrubs are? We know what scrubs are. This is someone in the medical field. Generally, a doctor, a surgeon, a nurse. When I worked at BioLife Plasma several years ago, we wore scrubs 
at BioLife. It was interesting. Someone wearing a nice suit. Well, that's somebody important, right? If they got a nice suit on, it's got to be important. They got to be an educator, maybe an attorney. You can tell the difference between a really nice suit and the $99 special at Halberstadt's, can't you? I got the Halberstadt suits at home myself. But the nicer the suit, the more important the person. But if someone is in rundown clothes, maybe they got some stains on their shirt, we also get an impression of who they are. We might think that they have no job. Maybe they're homeless. We probably think that they're uneducated. And whether we intend to or not, whether the behavior is conscious or subconscious, we treat people differently based on how they dress. Or we treat people differently on an aspect of how they look. Now we like to say that we are a welcoming church, that we welcome people, they can come as they are and they can find a home here. But do we treat people differently based on how they dress? Do we treat people differently based on how they look. I was a little surprised no one commented on this today, but I could see a little confusion in a few of you when you saw me wearing a t-shirt and shorts. I found that really interesting. And most people, if they walked in today not knowing me at all, a preacher up here wearing a t-shirt and, I mean, everything's clean, don't get me wrong here. I'm not, I didn't pull this out of the hamper this morning. But people, if they didn't know me, they'd maybe walk in and turn around and walk out. They wouldn't listen to the message today. Not because the message misses the mark. Not because the message isn't a good message, but because of what I've got on, what I'm wearing. And I believe that in the future, after I get this posted online and people watching right now live on Facebook, there's every likelihood in the world that someone's going to come across this sermon. They're going to watch the first 30 seconds of it and turn it off. Because somebody wearing a t-shirt and shorts and old worn out tennis shoes cannot possibly bring God's word. Are you here to listen to a message proclaiming that Jesus is Lord? Or do you go to church to see how the pastor is dressed? Does the sermon mean more if a preacher is wearing a nice suit than it does if they're wearing a t-shirt? The answer, of course, is no. So why so often do so many people act like it does? In order to hear the word, does someone need to be impeccably dressed? Of course not. But do we ever make people feel like they do? In order to go to church, you've got to have a nice, nice shirt, nice pair of pants. Do we ever make people feel like they do? We're finally on to chapter 2 of James. After 10 weeks, we're finally into chapter 2. I'm so excited to be on chapter 2. And chapter 2 starts out like this. James says, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Much like verse 1 of chapter 1, James makes a very bold proclamation about who Jesus is here. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Christ. If you want a little bit more detailed explanation of that, I, like I said, I preached that on James chapter 1. Um, it's available online. You can go back and watch that. But James continues on. We are warned as believers not to show favoritism. And James gives a specific example in the next three verses. He says, Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit at the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So what's happening in this example is that the people here are saying that this person over here is worthy of something good and this person over here is not worthy of something good simply based on their appearance. In other words, they are violating what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 
chapter 7, when he says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now these verses are often misused in many ways, in one extreme and the other. So often you'll hear someone say, well, you can't judge me when they're doing something really, really wrong. And it's, it's true, we can't judge them, but as Christians, to point out to a brother or sister that they're in sin is something that we must do. Pointing out the sin is not judging. On the other hand, we try to explain this away. I say, well, we can, we can still judge people. We, we obvi obviously, we always judge people. We look at how someone's dressed. We look at this, we look at this, we look at this. And we come up with a judgment. And we try to make it okay for us. But judging a person by what they wear, judging a person by how they look, how we see their place in society is what James is warning us about. And this is bad enough to be doing this, to give one person a special place based on what they're wearing and to give another something less based on the way they're dressed. But James is alluding to a situation where the favoritism is being shown to the people that are actually persecuting the believers. Back in chapter 1, we're warned about being tempted by evil desire right after James tells us about how believers should be proud of their humble circumstances. You're going to have to stick with me on this one for just a second. That's what he says in chapter 1. You should be proud of your humble circumstances. Proud because even though they, even though the believers are poor economically, they are rich spiritually. Chapter 12 of verse 1 starts out, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love them. So now what is the specific trial here that the believers are being told to resist. It's the persecution at the hands of the rich. So the temptation that they're facing is to get revenge on those who are persecuting them. Let's try to remember that. So it's the rich who are looking down on the poor believers, causing this trial, okay? But then in the next chapter, it's the believers that are giving a position of honor to one that is persecuting them. They're giving this position of honor to this rich person who comes in, probably the same guy that's been persecuting them. It doesn't add up. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong. The church in the first century, I believe the church today, the overall church today, and local churches as well, have a problem of how it treats people with wealth. How many of you have, have ever been to Boston and done the Freedom Trail in Boston? couple of you, okay. The churches you go into, if you guys remember the Old North Church in, in stories of, of uh, the revolution, one if by land, two if by sea, the lanterns hung up there, and everything. Futurama does a really funny thing with those. You have to check that episode out. But anyway, like you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Anyway, when you go into these churches, these old colonial churches, it's really interesting because they don't have chairs spread out like this. They don't have pews spread out like we normally think. They have what I can best describe as like half-height cubicles, if this makes sense to you. So they divide off little groupings. So like if these two chairs had a, had a half-height cubicle around them, and these chairs had a half-height cubicle, and your chairs had a half-height cubicle, and you're all separated like this. And each of those little cubicles was reserved for a family. And do you know how they decided who got what cubicle? It was based on how much that family gave to the church. So if you gave more, you got to sit closer to the front. If you gave less, you'd sit further back, which I think would have been perfect for a Midwestern back-of-the-church sitter like me. But, but that, was, that was the thing at the time, is if you gave more, you got to sit further, you got to sit closer to the pulpit, closer to the preacher, 
closer to the cross. There's another example I want to give, and it's, it has to do with us. I don't look at how much you give individually. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. For two reasons. Number one, I don't want the temptation that if someone from the congregation got sick, was in the hospital, needed a pastoral visit, I don't want the little voice in the back of my, my head to say, you know, Mike, you're really busy today, and they only gave $40 last month. Don't worry about visiting them. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to do that, but I also don't want that temptation. On the other side of that, I don't want to know how much people give, because if I start working on a sermon, and God is really, really speaking to me on something, and I say, you know what, this is probably going to step on somebody's toes, and that somebody is a big giver to the church, so I better not do that. I don't want that temptation either to say no to God in what he wants said to us. In giving as well, it's supposed to give as faithfulness to God, not to be noticed. Give so the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. We have some issues with wealth in the church. This brings up the idea that we have different standards for different people. Based on their wealth, based on their dress, based on their race, based on their status in society. And when we do this, we are not living up to the understanding that we get in Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, right off the bat. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. All humanity, all humanity is created in the image of God. We are all uniquely made. We are all individuals, but we also all bear that image of God. When we show favoritism, we diminish the individual from the person that God made them to be, and we turn them into an object. We turn them into someone to be sorted out, Someone to be put on a list, someone to be used, someone to be exploited. We miss the human in that person. And when we do not see the humanness, when we do not see the image of God in a person, we cannot love them for who God made them to be. And what is the greatest commandment? We've talked about this before. Love God, love people. Absolutely. And this sorting out is especially problematic, as, as James points out here, if we only see that person for what's on the surface. If we see them for what they're wearing. If we see the piercings they have or the tattoos that they have. Now, it might be hard for us as humans to see someone's heart if they have a tattoo covering their entire face. That's a tricky one for us. But God can see deep into a person's heart and love them. I'm going to give this a try. When we talk about the surface, what's on the surface of this, many of you guys heard of the band Blues Traveler. 90s band, have some really good songs. Uh, there's a song called Hook. If you're familiar with the song Hook, and, and I'm going to very poorly sing part of it to you right now. I shouldn't do this, but yes, we're sure. going to try it anyway. <laughs> Doesn't matter what I say, as long as I sing with inflection, makes you feel that I'll convey some inner truth or vast reflection. But I've said nothing so far. And I can keep it up as long as it takes. And it don't matter who you are. If I'm doing my job, it's your resolve that breaks. Because the hook brings you back. And despite the fact that I was in about four keys there, did you, Amen. did you, thank you. Thank you for your pity applause. I appreciate that. Did you catch the words? 
What's he singing about? Let me say them for you here one more time. I'll say them. I won't sing them again, but I'll say them so you can try to understand it. It doesn't matter what I say as long as I sing with inflection. It makes you feel that I'll convey some inner truth or vast reflection. But I've said nothing so far, and I can keep it up as long as it takes. And it don't matter who you are. If I'm doing my job, it's your resolve that breaks because the hook brings you back. It's a very catchy tune. It's a song about nothing. And he's telling you it's a song about nothing. And he's telling you he's using you. He's exploiting you in this song. He's tricking you with the hook to this song. And the hook to the song is the hook brings you back. I love that part. That's just so awesome. But it's... On the surface, we think there's something really, really important going on here. And there's not. We're fooled into believing something that isn't true, that isn't there. Well, that person is really well-dressed. They must be important. I should listen to them. Well, that person over there, they're wearing an old stained T-shirt. They can't possibly have anything to contribute Now, we're not talking about different abilities. We're not talking about different spiritual gifts in people. If the option for someone to sing is me or anyone else, especially Kim, (laughs) we ain't going with me. (laughs) Believe me. Not going to do that again. Now, the world can judge by outward appearance all it wants. It does that constantly. All the time. But in the church... We must be aware of the worldly influence to judge a book by its cover. To assign worth to a person based on their outward appearance. Our call as Christians is not to judge. Is to not assign importance. Our call as Christians is simply to love. I mentioned Danny Gokey's song a couple times the last few weeks, Love God and Love People. Yes, I love that song. Great, great song. And I want to close with a few lyrics from that song. I will not sing them. Yes. I'm more happy that I'm done singing today. But I want to close with a few lyrics from that song. Because it's, it, it really speaks. Got to keep it real simple. Keep it real simple. Bring everything back to ground zero. Because it all comes down to this. Love God and love people. We're living in a world that keeps breaking. But if we want to find a way to change it, it all comes down to this. Love God and love people. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for your word today. Lord, thank you for this lesson that we get through James. To see the heart of someone to look at who they truly are, to look at who they are in your eyes. Not to show favoritism, not to give one person a better position over another simply because of their dress or their wealth or any other outward factor. God, help us to see the heart of the individual. Thank you, God, for this time. Thank you for this message. Thank you for your love. And help us to remember, God, that greatest commandment. To love you, Lord God. And to love our neighbor. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your precious name we pray today. Amen.